Welcome to the 2023 Manly Electorate Candidates Forum uh, at Bucketty's here today at Brookvale. My name is Will Castle and I'm your moderator today. Um, but without further ado, I thought we'd um, introduce Alex Hall, who will acknowledge country. Please make him welcome. Voices of Aringa acknowledges the Guy Mariagle clan of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. We thank them for their wise stewardship of the lands and waters which were never ceded. This beautiful part of the world is a cultural landscape and we look forward to more of our lands and waters returning to traditional ownership and management. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, I'd now like to invite Catherine, who is the founder of Voices of Warringah, uh, to address us. Please make her welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight, and thank you for your interest in democracy in the wonderful seat of Manly. So, big woohoo for Manly. Yeah. Right, so uh, we're all a community first. And we all live together, work together and enjoy this beautiful place we now call home together. And tonight is about how we get the best outcome for Manly and all the things that you care about here locally. So tonight we've got all of the state candidates bar the Labor candidate who unfortunately has a shift tonight on the ferries. He works on the ferries so he won't be joining us but Alex who you've just met will be uh, reading out his statement on his behalf. And then we will go into some question and answers. So thank you again for coming. And I also just want to acknowledge the hard work of Nigel Howard and the Northern Beaches <laughs> Climate Action Network, who's co-hosting this event. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine and Nigel. Um, can we get another round of applause? Because they're the people who are organising this tonight. Thank you. Um, now, do we have Nick McDonald in the room? He's the, um, the founder, the owner of Buckety's. Please make him welcome. He's our host tonight. OK, thank you, everyone, for coming. Awesome to have everyone down here. This is a family business run by my, myself and my wife and our incredible team. A little bit of wisdom, they say a drunk mind speaks a sober heart. So make sure you get some of that truth serum there over the bar. Support us, we're supporting you guys. So thank you. Thanks to the candidates for coming down. Humbled to have so many powerhouses in the, in the house here. So please come down again, have a good time. And yeah, hopefully we get some, some good information tonight. Cheers. exciting part we're meeting our candidates so just before I introduce them I'll outline how this will work for tonight so we'll start off with some introductions some two-minute statements uh, we have a lovely bell ringer at the front who will be yep <laughs> okay so we've got a one and a half minute bell and then two minutes is the cutoff uh, now the candidates will draw a number from the hat and that is the order that they will be uh, making their statements. After that, we will then start the questions from all of you. So have them at the ready uh, and we'll make sure, my job tonight is to make sure that the candidates get to the questions um, as efficiently as possible and that we do cover a wide range of questions and topics. So we have tonight, and as the candidates step forward, please take a number out of the bucket. James Griffin from the Liberal Party. Number two. Thanks, James. Next is uh, Bailey Mason from the Animal Justice Party. Number three. Thanks, Bailey. Take a seat. Oh, you can take a seat, James. Uh, now, next is Jolene Hackman, uh, Independent. Number four. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. And Terry LaRue from the Greens. Number one, lucky number one. All right, well, let's get started. Um, Nigel, do you have the microphone for the candidates? So we'll start off with Terry LaRue from the Greens. We have two minutes, um, starting when you're ready. When you're ready, Terry. My name's Terry LaRue. My wife, and I, my wife and I arrived in Australia more than 40 years ago. We were evicted from South Africa by the authorities because of our opposition to the apartheid regime. And on arrival in Australia, I realized that what a fantastic country this is because there is no corruption here. <laughs> like, like we had in South Africa. But very soon, I was corrected by my friends here who said, corruption is rife in this country at all levels. And it's actually the corruption of mateship, which is a disease that came down from when the first whites arrived. And we have witnessed the corruption of mateship with both the coalition and with the Labour, Labour parties through pork barrelling, jobs for the boys, and the political appointments to independent bodies that takes place all the time. So why am I standing as the, the Greens candidate in Manly? It's not necessarily because I want to be in Parliament. It's to help the Greens get the last seat in the Legislative Council or else it will go to a One Nation or a Shooters and Fishers candidate. I joined the Greens 15 years ago at the same time that I started working with community groups in Balgala and in Manly. And I, and I, jo I, jo I joined the Greens because they did not have or follow the corruption of mateship and they did not accept dollars from any corporates so, so that influence could be purchased from the Greens. So, so by voting for Greens on the 25th of March, you are stating your support for what the Greens stand for. And the four pillars of the Greens are protect and preserve the environment, social justice for those who are less well off in society, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Terry. We'll just park the mic. We'll pass the microphone down to James Griffin, who's the second uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Good to go. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Will, uh, for being the MC tonight and putting your hand up to do it, and to Catherine and to uh, Nigel for your efforts in putting on this evening, and to each and every every one of you for being here tonight to do a bit of politics in the pub and have a good time. So thank you all for coming out and engaging in, uh, in our democracy. The last couple of years have been pretty challenging for people right across New South Wales um, and that includes us here in Manly. Either we were touched or we knew people that were touched by floods, by pandemic, by bushfires or by the drought. But all through that time in this community there was a common thread and that common thread was our love and our commitment and our support to one another. It was community. It was caring for our neighbours. It was looking after one another. And I saw that maybe it was my role as patron of Community Northern Beaches, where they worked hard day in, day out to make sure that they kept their doors open for the vulnerable and the voiceless in our community. Or my role as patron for Northern Beaches Women's Shelter, who last year we managed to get funding to expand their services on the Northern Beaches as bad as it is that we need it. Or through the work that our local businesses did, our small business owners who worked together on the economic recovery task force that I put together to help rebuild and rebound our local economy. But we've got to keep going. 
because there's no point in stalling and going backwards. And what I'm committed to doing is ensuring that we continue to build on the work of the past six years, which has been upgrading our local schools, investing in our local infrastructure, supporting our public transport, and supporting the young people in our community. So what I'm committed to doing is bringing the same energy and enthusiasm of our wonderful community to the next four years. And that includes a modern, thriving local economy, supporting our local schools, improving our local public transport, and equally supporting our beautiful, thriving local environment. It's been a privilege to be the member for Manly for the last six years and bring Manly to the heart of government. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Now I'll hand over to Bailey. I'm running for Manly because there's actually a lot of animal cruelty happening here. So I'm talking about dolphins, whales and turtles are dying slow, painful deaths in these killer shark nets. There are alternatives and we do not need these killer shark nets. In fact, at Manly Beach between 2001 and 2022, the bycatch was 98%. 98% bycatch. So that's only 2% target sharks. This is wrong. This is killing dolphins, whales, turtles and marine life. And I just want to remind everyone here as well, everyone, every single candidate here has voiced out against these killer shark nets, except for the Environment Minister, has not called for these dolphin killing shark nets to be removed. That's a shame. So that's why I'm running, because we need to have a voice for these animals. We cannot allow dolphins and whales to die on the northern beaches. I'm also running because on the northern beaches, it's legal with permits to actually capture marine life for aquariums. In fact, the Northern Beaches Council is capturing our marine life and putting them in tanks. That's a disgrace as well. It's not right. There's also the issue of animals in the circus. Animals, uh, animal circuses continue to come to the northern beaches and are forcing these animals to perform demeaning tricks. This is not right, and that's why I'm standing. We also have the issue of the 1080 poison. People's dogs, our dogs are eating these poisons and are suffering and dying for up to seven minutes. This is wrong. We need to take animal rights seriously, and that's why I'm here. And the Animal Justice Party as a whole has great policies on factory farming, banning the cruel, barbaric greyhound racing industry and other exploitive industries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bailey. Uh, Now, our fourth candidate is Jolene Hackman, Independent. (laughs) Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming tonight because I am so inspired by all of you. You all care about democracy enough to be here. Thank you to Cathy and Nigel, and especially Will, for stepping up the last moment to making tonight happen. So, a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in the Northern Beaches. I'm a a local and I am raising my family here. I have two young boys and my husband is a doctor up at the Northern Beaches Hospital. I'm a local successful businesswoman and five years ago, I started the Northern Beaches War on Waste because I knew that we needed... (laughs) I knew that we needed local solutions to global problems and we needed to connect with the government to push them and hold them to account. I also started Feed Our Medics during the pandemic because I knew that nurses need much more support and businesses needed more income. We delivered to more than 3,000 deliveries across nine hospitals across Sydney. Why I'm here today is because my community asked me to run. They are looking for a stronger voice in Parliament. Now... Manly has a history of independence. Four out of the last six terms have been led by independent government. You'll see Dr Peter MacDonald there. We all know David Barr and also Zali Stegall at a federal level. 
you'll note that Zali Stegall had a majority. She had an increase in her votes when she was re-returned to Parliament this last term. An independent voice to Parliament works because we put the community first. I've been door knocking for many months and the community is telling me that they want stronger action on climate change. We don't want coal and gas projects. We want more integrity in politics, no more pork barrelling, no more jobs for mates. And we want to return to responsible economic management. We are in budget deficit and I'm tired of this waste of expenditure. So that's why I'm here today. The community is asking for change and I want to put my community at number one and that's where I'd like you to put me on the ballot. Thank you, Jolene. Uh, now we have Alex Hall, who did our acknowledgement of country from Voices of Warringah, to read out the statement from the Labor candidate, Jasper Yaron David Thatcher. Thanks, Alex. Good evening, everyone. Sorry that I cannot attend tonight's event. I'm currently on a night shift at work. Nonetheless, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Jasper Yaron David Thatcher. I'm 23 years old and I have lived in Manly my whole life. I currently work full-time on the Manly to Circular Quay run for one of the Manly ferry oper operators, rather. And I've done so for the past five years across multiple companies and classes of vessels. I'm also studying law part-time. I have a proud Indigenous history. My mob's name is the Cam Camilla Roy tribe from northwestern New South Wales. I've been heavily involved with multiple committees dealing with Indigenous affairs, and I was responsible for the Aboriginal flag being flown permanently on all vessels at Sydney Ferries, with plenty more ideas currently being worked on. <laughs> this election is about an opportunity for a fresh start in Manly and New South Wales. Labor's plans for Manly will see more teachers in classrooms and more individual attention for kids that need it. It will mean investing in health workers and returning the hospital beds that this government has cut. Labor will return the reliable freshwater class to a more regular weekday service. It will also see the improvement of bus services on the beaches after privatisation by the current government. It will not see government land developed and sold off. And I'm particularly excited by Labor's environmental policies this election. On climate, the current government pretends that they have recently woken up to climate change, but they've spent more than 12 years in government in denial and delay. And they still have refused to legislate the aspirational climate targets. Labor will legislate in law at least 50% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. At the latest, and we'll establish a net zero commission to develop a plan and update the targets uh, where progress is possible. On energy, privatisation of energy assets has forced up prices and made the transition to renewables more difficult. Labor will establish a publicly owned corporation, the Energy Security Corporation, to invest an initial one billion in storage for renewables like pumped hydro and community batteries. Uh, this sensible government investment will fix the gaps where private sector is facing challenges. It dwarfs the government's ambition and fills a real gap in the current energy mix. On environment, when it comes to the natural environment, the government has outsourced... Thank you. Thanks, Alex, and also thank you to Jasper for putting in that statement. So now I'll just move to some rules before we start the Q&A section. Uh, the first is that I'm the moderator and my job is to make sure that our discussions run smoothly, that the questions cover all or as many topics as we can, um, and that our candidates answer the questions. Um, rule two is that we want to cover as many great questions as possible. So when you get the microphone, please keep your question brief and to the point. Please say your name and who the question is uh, directed to, and that can be more than one candidate. I ask that the candidates answer the questions directly so, when, so we can get the best understanding of everyone's positions on a wide range of topics. There shall be no interrupting of anyone, and that shouldn't be a problem since we only have one microphone for all the candidates. Um, so please, if you wish to speak, just signal to me. Um, 
And of course, no heckling. Please respect the candidates and allow them to complete their answers uninterrupted. Um, we will ask anyone disrupting uh, the forum to leave. Now, we have two microphone runners, and we'll start the questions now. I believe it's Sarah at the back. Go ahead, Sarah. Thanks, My name's Sarah Baker, and this question is for Jolene Hackman and James Griffin, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so, with the public awareness of the myriad of rorts and pork barrelling and resignations over scandals that seem to litter New South Wales politics, what three practical steps would you take to restore some integrity in New South Wales Parliament and improve our trust in parliamentarians. Who would like to start? Jolene or...? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarah. It's a wonderful question. Um, so I don't know if you've seen my socials or uh, it's been a busy couple of days or if it's even on my socials, but yesterday I launched my integrity policy because I firmly believe that our community wants to see a return to honest government. We need to have leaders who are leaders. And that includes quite a few steps, but you asked for three, so I'll give you three. Number one, close the loopholes about jobs for mates. We need a transparent... Merit. Transparent, merit-based process for appointing jobs. Number two, we need to stop political donations from coal and gas and gambling companies. There is a clear conflict of interest when those vested interests have influence over our politicians. Number three, I would make sure that we have an independently funded ICAC. Because we need to know the people who are investigating our elected officials are held to account by a transparent, well-funded process that they cannot get out of. I will let you know, sorry, Will, that in this current three term of governments, two premiers, that's not two, two premiers and 12 ministers have resigned under the cloud of ICAC investigations. I say enough. Okay. Thank you, Jolene. So we heard three steps from Jolene. James, do you agree with those or are there additional steps that you would like to make? Well, I think it's a given that most Australians would want and demand um, the highest of integrity in their political system, of course. Um, in New South Wales, the ICAC has never been funded more than it is right now. And uh, I'd ask them, for example, that Yes, they do concentrate on ensuring that they're investigating uh, all levels of government, local, state, uh, in terms of um, any irregularities or corruption that is perceived to take place. But equally, um, they should concentrate on doing the job. And I think that there is one leader in this state who 610 or so day, days into a report being launched into her um, was unfairly removed as a Premier of this state. And I'm very happy to say that I back Gladys Berejiklian every single day of the week. So the ICAC should hurry up with the work that it's doing and get the report out there so Gladys can have that removed, that cloud removed from over her head. But the point is, the ICAC has never been funded more than it is today. And of course, citizens deserve to make sure that politicians act with the highest of integrity. Um, that is a given. We've implemented grant guidelines that ensure that pork barrelling does not take place and that the stringent checks and balances that are needed to ensure Should that... Should there be additional measures for that given the history of people like John Barillaro? Are there additional restrictions you would like to see? Well, those grant guidelines came in post those particular issues and on the back of a response to the Audit Office. So we're putting into, into effect significant measures to fight corruption and ensure that people can have the utmost confidence in their government. No, sorry, we, we do want to get to as many questions as possible. Um, yeah. Just very quickly. 20 seconds. Okay. 
Okay, all right, let's get to another question. Can we have a hand up, please? From the front, thank you. Um, I'm Isabel Young, a youth leading the world delegate and a local school student. I recently interviewed both uh, James Griffin and Jolene Hackman, and I have a question for James. Um, James, why was the administration here told today that you weren't going to answer any climate questions when you are, in fact, our environment minister? Questions. Go, go for it. And, and in fact, it's probably worthwhile. You know, if, if you want to have a talk about climate, which I'm sure that many people in this audience do, um, let's talk about the record, which is a good one of this government. And don't take my word for it, right? Let's take the World Wildlife Fund, um, a revered independent organisation who, again, put New South Wales as the leading state in the country when it comes to our renewable energies plan. And that's backed by four years' worth of work that this government has done to implement its net zero strategy, underpinned by the electricity infrastructure roadmap and boosted by our renewable energy zones. So if you want to have a talk about climate, I'm more than happy to do that, and uh, it, it, it's something that I'd welcome. Okay. Thank you, James. Uh, can I just add, when I said no heckling, I mean no heckling, so please keep the, um, the, the comments to a minimum. Now, we'll go to... Do you want to ask another I question? Uh, if that's all right. Uh, I, okay, just very quickly. Uh, in that case, last time we met, you rated your uh, party's past environmental policies a 9.5 out of 10, and recently you stood with the New South Wales Treasurer, Matt Keane, to announce a new emissions reduction target of 70% by 2035. That sounds amazing. And yet, New South Wales is currently planning to open at least 23 to 26 new coal mines and massively increase our fossil fuel exports to the rest of the world by 155 million tonnes. Isn't it disingenuous to claim the environmental high ground whilst at the same time actually increasing our state's carbon footprint by selling dirty coal to other countries? Good, good question. And um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that when it comes to our state, we have our net zero plan, which is being implemented and worked out. What you're talking about is scope three emissions. Now, scope three emissions are not measured by any state in the country or, 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 um, or Australia when it comes to the exports of, of coal. We have a plan in New South Wales to reach net zero. We've updated that target. We have our electricity infrastructure roadmap backed by billions to undertake a transition. Now, to go out there and say that the um, coal-fired power stations have to shut immediately would be reckless in terms of making sure that we do develop and work through a sensible, rational transition that has been worked through by the Chief Scientist and the New South Wales Office for Climate Change. So we have a plan. It's there. It's world-leading. The World Wildlife Fund um, climate change uh, activists and parents have backed it in every single day of the week. OK, thank you, James. Uh, just so we can uh, finish up on that particular issue of coal mines, can we get... Um, Terry, would you like to say something? The position of the Greens um, on climate change has been well known, and the Greens were at the forefront of bringing to the, the country's attention that it was the emissions of CO2 that were leading to the warming of the climate. Um, and the, the Greens have always led the way in this area, and because the Greens don't have either a position in the government or even um, the, the balance of power in it, its ability to influence it is going to be restricted by the number of, Senate, the number of legislative as council members that it has. So if you vote for the Greens in the legislative council, there's a better chance that the position that, the honest position that they take will have a better chance of influencing the, the, whatever decisions the government of the day has. So can I just um, ask Terry, is, is it the position of the Greens that you want to essentially end all future proposals for coal mines? You want them all rejected? Just, just a yes or no, uh, yes. is that? That's yes. Most okay. Certainly. Can we get that from every candidate? Jolene, is that a yes or a no? The community tells me they want no new coal or gas projects. So okay. I 100% support... No new coal or gas projects for New South Wales. All right. And <laughs> yes or no, Bailey? I, I stand... Am I on here? Yeah. Um, I stand for that uh, as well.
However, I think we do need to acknowledge the link between animal agriculture and climate change as well. That's often not being looked at. And I also want to mention as well the factory farming of fish. Recently, there was a Four Corners on uh, Tazcal salmon, and it was exposed that the World Wildlife Fund is being bought um, to have their logo on non-environmentally friendly products, including factory farmed fish. And as we've seen, the Environment Minister has name-dropped the World Wildlife Fund. And that's been exposed on Four Corners uh, very recently. So I just wanted to note that down. All right, let's go to another question now. Um, Nigel, let's go to the lady at the back there on, on your left. Yep. Hello, I'm Nicole and I've got a question for Bailey, representing Animal Justice Party. Uh, Bailey, how do you see that we're going to make a change with animals and circuses, is my first little bit, and then how we're going to ban puppy mills and kitten mills, please? So I'm working on that and I've been talking to the council uh, to get a ban on the use of all animals in the circus on the northern beaches. We don't want to have any animal be forced to perform tricks. It's cruel, it's outdated. Uh, the puppy mills, same, going to the council and then further I need to ban greyhound racing and those barbaric industries as well. But I just keep... On, I've also been talking with the Greens as well about pushing forward to ban the use of all animals um, in the circus. And uh, just last year we had about 50 people protesting on the northern beaches against animals in the circus. OK. Now we'll go to another question. Um, the lady over here. Yep. Hi, my name's Steph. I guess my question is, at a federal level, the teals haven't actually had a lot of power. So in terms of things like PEP 11, we haven't been able to have that stopped by the teals, and particularly those locally. So I guess how are all of you going to make sure you can actually achieve things in the next term of parliament? Thank you so much for your question. It's very kind of you. Um, so, as we've seen, the independents actually have a lot of power, and particularly in a minority government. We've seen Alex Greenwich, as an example, uh, put forward the voluntary assisted dying bill and able to get cross-party support. What the independents can do is vote. They can vote first according to their community. We can put forward private members' bills, we can amend the legislation so that it has better quality legislation. In terms of gambling, we can make sure there's better quality legislation for that. So an independent, particularly in a minority government, is very influential, very influential, and we are able to put the community first. Thank you, Jolie. I'll just go to James quickly um, on a similar note of... What, a, what the local member for Manly can do. Um, you might be aware there's a recent poll that showed that although it's close, Labor would probably win either in a minority or majority government. So similarly, what could you do if you were re-elected but as an opposition MP? Well, the, the poll, the only one that matters on election day is, is, is what they say. And um, I think it's really important to acknowledge the comment that was made before about, about the Teals. I mean, we, we've heard a lot right, about, about the, the power of the teals. But you look at the federal sphere at the moment and we were told that an Albanese government with the elected teals would stop PEP 11. But here we are having to re-prosecute PEP 11 again. Alex Greenwich is a good independent because he is independent. He backs in the government when we have sensible and sound policies and he supports and works with us. He's not a protest party. The fact is that we will continue to do work as a good, good government. We're intent on winning. We're putting together a bold vision for New South Wales, and it's one that people are responding to. With respect to what has happened previously, we've seen how this unfolds. Labor government with an independent member. Overlooked, under-resourced, left hanging. At one point, there was a special commission of inquiry into the ferries because of the dire state that they got into. There was no beeline, there was no park and ride, there were no upgraded schools, and that was under a Labor government with an independent member. So they are not things that people in this community have forgotten, and they also appreciate and understand the ability of a good, hard-working local member to get things done. 
We'll go on to another question. Um, we'll go with this lady at the front here. Hi, my name's Lani and this is controversial. It's not directly related to environment or climate. I'm a registered nurse. Registered nurses during COVID were essential workers. We saved lives. We continue to save lives. A recent... <laughs> oh, look, I'm not nursing now, so don't clap me. I've got kids, but... A recent... <laughs> Uh, a recent poll taken by the New South Wales, I'm so nervous, Nurses and Midwifery Association came back with 50% of nurses planning to leave the profession in five years. This does not just affect nurses, this affects everybody. I worked pre-COVID. I managed a busy coronary care unit, people coming in, having heart attacks, dropping dead. We were short then. We were struggling then. This is a public hospital. What are your parties going to do to resolve this issue? Good question. Uh, let's go to Jolene first and then we'll go to James. Lani, I just want to say a huge thank you because, honestly, that was an incredible crisis and if it wasn't for people like you who stood up and went to that cold face at the hospital, none of us would be here. It's a hugely contagious disease and you didn't know the impacts on you or your family and you went to work anyway. So thank you. Before the pandemic, there was a shortage of 110,000 workers and the Liberal National Government knew about this and they didn't do enough. They know that there's a shortage of workers that are helping at the front line and they've done nothing about it. We have amazing people, paramedics, uh, emergency services crew, key workers and nurses. And those nurses are paid a terrible wage and they are filled and they are filled with red tape in order to get any overtime. It's despicable what they go through. Now, nurses are incredible human beings and they need to be supported. The thing is they only need a little bit of care and they'll keep caring. They have never gone on strike except for as much as they did in, in the last two years because the Liberal National Government do not care about nurses. Now, one of the first things that I would do if I'm elected is put forward a private member's bill that would increase the wages, the state award for nurses and pan paramedics. It's essential. Do, do you have a measure by how much that would be or is it independently set? I would go to the Fair Work Commission and, and, and get recommendations about that. But I do know that their salary has been docked over the pandemic. They've had a real wages decrease. And that is something I'm terribly embarrassed about. Because this government in 12 years has not seen the value of nurses and has not implemented policy to take care of them. I would also be implementing nurse-to-patient ratios for several reasons. Just quickly before we quickly. go to James. Every hospital, $69 million they could save at every single hospital if we implemented nurse-to-patient ratios. As well, and, sorry, 145 lives could be saved by implementing nurse-to-patient ratios. It shortens hospital stays and, more importantly... It delivers care for nurses who tell me that they can't fall asleep because they hear patients crying that they couldn't get to on their shift because they are so short-staffed. Now, this Liberal National Government is fine to take care of forestry corporations and coal companies. I say we take care of nurses and key workers first. Okay. We'll go to James now. Lani, we've met before, and I want to thank you for, for what you've done um, through what was a really difficult time, not only for New South Wales, but the whole country. And you were the backbone of making sure that people in this room and this community were kept safe. And thank you. I think if you want to run for parliament, you have to be very careful and considered with your words and honest about what has taken place. To suggest that a government does not care or did not care about its workforce, in particular its nurses, is insulting to the good staff that work in New South Wales Health and also 
to the bureaucrats that have worked around the clock to support the, the staff, the nurses, the paramedics and the hospitals. Sorry, James, just, no, no, just I'll, quickly. I'll, I'll, um, given that, and I think we could all recognise that in the last year particularly, there have been a lot of strike action yep. from unions. Given that you would say that it is an insult to say the government doesn't care, is that a minority of people, do you think? Or No, no, of course, it's the year of the strike. The unions made that very clear as we go into an election year. The facts are... Under the past Labor government, they shut and closed more hospitals than we have opened in the past couple of years. More than 190 new hospitals and medical centres built around New South Wales. Fact. The facts are that we've also gone out to bolster and support our nurses, to recruit more and to make sure that we pay a fair wage that is in line with the wages cap and the wages policy. Because it's, if it's removed, and I'd love to know uh, the other candidates' position on whether they support removing the wages cap, um, it is, what we can do is provide certainty around how much of a pay increase, which is some of the generous, most generous in the nation, to our important, hardworking uh, frontline staff. In addition to that, we're supporting nurses and frontline health workers with um, housing equity to help make sure that they can live where they work and equally providing as much support as we possibly can to ensure that we've got a thriving um, health frontline service workforce. Thank you. Can we just go very quickly back to the, if that's okay. I'd just like to ask is, are those the responses you wanted to hear or is there more you want a, a member for Manly to do? Yes. Nurses do need to be paid more and Minister, would you support removing the wages cut? What I support is giving certainty to not only nurses but all frontline workers that we've got around New South Wales. How do we do Our that? Six, by providing certainty in the wages cap. If you remove the wages cap, which is the Labor Party's policy, and I don't know the opinion and view on, on the other candidates on this, but I'm sure most people would like to hear it, is that it blows a massive dent in the budget, which removes our ability to invest and provide other services, not only in health, but right across. We can provide certainty in terms of our 6% pay increase plus some that we're doing for teachers and likewise for nurses. Yeah. And I'm more than happy to do that. But the suggestion that the government knew about this and didn't do anything or doesn't care about its workforce is absolutely incorrect and wrong. And you can't just go around saying it. Okay. Let's, let's go to another question. Okay. Yep, we've got one at the back here. Australia is one of the global leaders in the destruction of nature and biodiversity and one of the top seven nations that contribute to 50% of global biodiversity loss. Biodiversity underpins our food security, nutrition, human health and makes the earth habitable. Healthy rivers and wetlands are biodiversity hotspots supporting an incredible array of wildlife, communities, food production and enterprises. Recently, huge amounts of brand new food plane, sorry, food plane harvesting entitlements were handed out by the New South Wales government. Vast volumes of water can now continue to be taken from inland rivers for the benefit export cotton grown by multinational corporations who pay little Sorry, I'm nearly there. If any tax, while the environment, graziers, tourism, recreational fishing and horticulture miss out. The New South Wales Government's Environment and Heritage Group advised the Environment Minister not to approve the water management rules recently proposed by the National Party Water Minister, as they would allow far too much flood water to be taken and likely be unlawful? This is my question. Would you vote in Parliament to protect the extraction of flood water from inland rivers being sold first to anonymous, sometimes foreign owners, so that wetlands, biodiversity and farmers are protected? And okay. this is for Jolene and James. All right. I'll also hand over to Terry as well. I'd like to hear everyone's position, but very quickly. Thank you, for, thank you for raising what is um, one of the, the key issues 
and the key policy platforms that the Greens have, when I mentioned that there are four pillars on which the Greens have become established, the very first one was to protect the environment, and that includes both the biodiversity of plant life and also the biodiversity in, in animal life. And water is critical to um, maintaining a stable equilibrium in, within the environment. And if you go back to the role of many of, of, of the Greens members in the, both in the House of Assembly and also in the Legislative Council have pushed for measures aggressively with the government to oppose many of the rorts that are taking place in the, um, the harvesting of rainwater, uh, the theft of water from the, the, the water systems, and also the destruction on a large scale of, of vegetation, which, um, which is the home to so many iconic Australian species. The Greens are proud of what they've done and they would continue to be aggressive in this. And I'm sure James appreciates that he always has to look over his shoulder at what the Greens are going to say when there's ever going to be any change to legislation. Okay. Thank you. Well, I have to give that to James to reply. Thanks, uh, Will and Terry. Thank you for the question. Um, you would have seen earlier this week we acquired the largest ever parcel of land to create a national park. Uh, in New South Wales, ever, <laughs> ever, in the, in the history of New South Wales by any government. Fundamental to that acquisition was that it in contained the last free-flowing uh, river in Australia, which is now protected in perpetuity within that national park. In addition to that, recently, we did a wonderful partnership with Nari Nari Tribal Council and the Nature Conservancy to protect in perpetuity beautiful wetlands, 55,000 hectares, containing important water, yes. In addition to that, the Biodiversity Conservation Trust, founded by the New South Wales Liberal and Nationals Government, has protected more than 2.3 million hectares of land, which again creates, creates or includes important wetlands and river systems. In addition to that, we're working with farmers and the fact is that more than 70% of New South Wales is held in private hands. And so we need to work with those communities and those landholders to make sure that we give them an understanding of the conservation benefits that we all know and appreciate of making sure that they conserve their land. And that is done through two ways, both regulatory and also through incentives. And so our Nature Positive Farming Program will help landholders preserve their water streams and the riparian environments that they've got on their land. And we're rolling that out. $200 million is a part of last year's budget, which I must say is a part of a $2.2 .2 billion budget for the environment, which dwarfs the entire federal government's budget, $1.7 billion. So we are doing the right thing here in New South Wales, and we're very proud of our environmental record. In addition to that, we've made sure that all the 20 of the 33 water resource plans that are a part of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan have been submitted to the federal government for accreditation. In addition to that, I've commenced a review of the Biodiversity Conservation Act, which ensures that the regulatory settings for water and land management are appropriate into the future. And that is being led by Ken Henry, former Commonwealth Treasury Secretary, an eminent Australian. Last point I'll make is that this year, the Commonwealth Government signed up to 30 by 30, a great concept. At the National Environment Minister's meeting, I put our hand up as a state, New South Wales, to lead the discussion to make sure that we identified appropriate land to put into that 30 by 30 commitment to make sure that our waterways, riparian areas and beautiful ecosystems across this state are protected in perpetuity and we're doing that work as we speak. Okay, thank you James. In the interest of getting, in the interest of getting to more questions, we will move on. Uh, I thought I got a chance to respond okay, to that one. Okay, yep, just very quickly. Yep, sure. So I have had people come to my office to brief me about the Murray-Darling Basin and the wetlands there. And what they tell me is a completely different story. What I hear from them and from many farmers around New South Wales is that the Liberal National Party are selling off so much of our water to anonymous entities who do not pay tax, and they are getting that water out of the rivers ahead of our farmers who supply our food, as well as First Nations communities. 
So it's a disingenuous answer to say that he's taking care of that. The, the water is critical to biodiversity. And New South Wales has a terrible track record on biodiversity. We have a sham offset scheme. And Australia is one of the worst countries for biodiversity. In fact, we are in a group, a terrible group, of seven countries in the world who are responsible for 50% of global biodiversity loss. We may talk about numbers, we may talk about investment, but I can tell you here and now, we are not going fast enough and we are not going far enough. 30% of our country needs to be protected by 2030. It was a federal obligation, as James mentioned. However, in New South Wales, we only have about 11% of our native forest, sorry, of our trees protected. So if we ended native forest logging this year, as I would like to do, to protect our koalas, we would only, thank you, we would only be at about 12 or 13 percent. So it's 2023 and to get to 30 percent protection in the next seven years is impossible at the pace of change the Liberal National Government is leading us. Okay. So they can spend our money, but they are fund, uh, funding fossil fuel projects and cutting down of trees and it's not going to help us meet our targets. Okay. Um, just going on from native logging, we do have uh, some pre-submitted questions and I'll let James reply briefly to that and answer this question before we get to one from the audience. This is from Sean O'Shanassi. Hannessy. Oh, my, my apologies for that mispronunciation. He says, we know that ending native forest logging was, uh, is the single most effective action we can take for our climate. So we heard that Jolene agrees to an immediate phase out of native forest logging. Uh, James, is that something you support and why or why not? Well, what we need to uh, keep doing is implementing the strategies and the plans that have been put together by independent scientists and experts providing their view to government on how we can go to meet our target, our aim, of doubling the koala population by 2050. So is that a flat no and just... No, no, not at all, if, 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 if I can answer. Um, and I think, it, you know, it's important also, just want to clarify the comment that was made before that the New South Wales Liberal Government is selling water to anonymous uh, entities. I, that is factually incorrect. Sorry, why that does... Let, let's just let James finish and then very briefly and then we're going to a question. Well, it's quite important to deal in the facts and the New South Wales Liberal Government, National Government, does not sell water to unknown anonymous entities. What we need to do is um, continue to work with private landholders who own more than 70% of the state. That's a fact. And these are farming communities and people that work the land. But there is change happening. They're enthusiastic about ensuring that they can deliver great conservation benefits and outcomes whilst we still have uh, an agribusiness. And so we're working with them to ensure that um, they get the support that they need whilst we have a strong re regulatory environment to make sure that um, we support our native vegetation, grow our national parks estate, invest in biodiversity conservation, which we'll continue to do, and deliver on our nation-leading koala strategy, the biggest in the country, $190 million rolling out as we speak on projects that are making a difference right now. Okay, Bailey, I'd like to hear from you on this. Uh, do you support an end to, or an immediate phase out of native forest logging? Um, you can reply to James as well. Yes, absolutely. Need to protect the environment completely. I just wanted to add as well, you know, liberals basically, oh, we'll bulldoze a few less koalas. No, the Animal Justice Party, we want no koalas being bulldozed. <laughs> Okay, let's go to a new question. Uh, yep, we've got one over here in the corner. Hi there, uh, my name's Lee. Nice, easy question for each of you. Uh, you don't need to turn on the, the political side of things. Hung Parliament, who are you currently leaning towards supporting? It's, it's two-word answer, Mins or Perrottet? All right, let's go from right to left, Terry. Mins. Sorry, oh. well... Sorry, I didn't hear that, Terry. Could you say that again? Uh, the Labour government, Mins. Okay, thank you. I'll grant confidence and supply to whichever government is going to stop new coal and gas 
and native forest logging. So, okay. So just, just to clarify, you won't specify until after negotiations. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Let's go to Bailey. Uh, whichever has the best animal welfare policy, that is where the Animal Justice Party stands, and environmental policies, obviously, because it's all um, connected. Is there any side in particular you see that has that better policy? Um, I think just Liberal and, and Labor are a real shame to animals, and it would be more so leaning towards um, Greens and, and Jolene Hackman, to be honest. That's where it would be leaning to. All right. Um... James, you're a Liberal Party anyway. You're in government or opposition. So let's go to another question. One over here down the front, Nigel. This, this, we will come to the back. Um, we've already heard a lot on climate change and, it, and environment. It's very important. But I want to understand either the track record or policy on domestic violence or what you propose in relation to domestic violence. Let's go to James first. Thank you. And... Uh, thanks for the question. It's, it's unfortunate that this is something that we have to address. And I think um, it's also unfortunate in that it doesn't matter your postcode or where you live in New South Wales or what you've got in your bank account. This is an unfortunate, insidious issue that affects um, far too many women and, and men. Um, we have legislated this year uh, against coercive control which was an important moment, um, and we've led the country in that. More locally, uh, I've been proud to do work as patron of the Northern Beaches Women's Shelter, and despite uh, it being a shame that it's needed, we have had to increase and expand the services. And so we've secured funding uh, to do just that. The work that, uh, that those people do um, is amazing. And as a government, we are completely committed by not only from a legislative perspective, and we've done and proven that we have a record to be able to deliver on that, but equally the funding that goes into providing more women's shelters and more support for domestic violence uh, victims and their families. Thank you. I'll go to Jolene quickly before another question. I think it's common knowledge that one woman dies every week in Australia at the hands of her partner. And in fact, the biggest health risk for women between the ages of 18 and 44 is the partner that she chooses. Domestic violence is a serious issue that needs multifactorial focus and support. I've met with many women's shelters and um, I am going to be coming out with a policy next week before International Women's Day around exactly that. What we need to do is change the culture. And when we have only one woman pre-selected in the government out of 17 as a woman, I think that really says what the current leadership of the government think about women. I would like to contribute to a balanced view in Parliament and make sure everyone's voice is heard and represented and that we legislate and finance support services that are compassionate and caring to the inequities of society that have contributed to this situation. Okay. I'll, just give the, I'll just give the question to the gentleman in the front, uh, uh, in the back, sorry. Uh, thank you, my name is Andrew Gill. My question relates to the Northern Beaches Hospital and the issue of integrity. Uh, Mr Moderator Will, if you could allow me several minutes to set the scene to, you, to my question, I'll that would be much appreciated. I'll give you 30 seconds and that's all we have time for. I'm sorry. This email on my hand I sent to the Honourable Member for Manly, Mr James Griffin, on 13 July 2021, four weeks before my 14-year-old son died in the back of a car in DY. He had been at the Northern Beaches Hospital eight times that year. Four days before he died, he went to the hospital under police guard, in handcuffs, blood all over him. I'm repeating from the hospital records, which I had to subpoena because they would not give them to me because it's governed by a private company and therefore not subject to freedom of information laws. I had to get that information. They did not give him a mental health care assessment. 
He'd been there seven times and they never called us when my son went there. Admitted fact from the CEO of the Northern Beaches Hospital. I'm a solicitor. I used to work at the RBA as an economist. My job was to monitor government finances. And I tell you, the research that we've done on the hospital is atrocious. It is owned by a Cayman Island listed entity. Fact. ASIC records. It pays NBH operator code one and two, pay one dollar a year in rent to rent the premises. To rent the building for 20 years, one dollar a year. To rent the car park, one dollar a year. And you sit here and you talk about integrity. I have correspondence from the Northern Sydney Local Health District that says, and I, and I paraphrase, that the private company is not penalised when it, there is any substandard care. Is not penalised. It's a private company. My research indicates that we pay $500 million a year to the private company to run a public hospital in our backyard. There is nothing there for kids. One more fact. It costs $90 million to run Manly Hospital. It costs $90 million to run Monavale Source, New Northern Sydney Local Health District financial statements. They're on the website. Yet we pay $500 million a year to a private company based in the Cayman Islands and there's 30% less public care beds. It does not make sense. My question is, integrity for me is getting up here and talking about this in the context of the death of my son. What does integrity mean to you? Sorry, I can't see you with the lights, but I'm very sorry that... Right, I don't want stories. Okay. We want an action that's been approached by so many other families. All we want to do is to make sure the students have their beds at the hospital so no other kids die. All right, James, your response. Yeah. Thank, Mr Gill, thank you. I can only imagine... Um, the courage that it would have took to get up and ask that question, and I'm sure that the um, the the sense and the response that you felt uh, from this room demonstrates how we, as a community, uh, feel for what has happened. And as a father of a four-year-old boy and a two-and-a-half-year-old girl, um, I can only imagine the trauma and the challenge that you've been through. So thank you for asking the question. And in large part, it was your experience and what happened to you and your advocacy since that point in time that led to um, more funding being allocated in last year's budget specifically to support uh, mental health services on the northern beaches. In addition to that, this issue of mental health... It, Okay, let's just, yeah, yeah. James. So, the, no, 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 it's all right. And the issue of mental health, particularly in young people on our northern beaches, has been an issue for a number of years. And it's never been entirely quite clear why. We live in a beautiful part of the world, surrounded by wonderful people. What I did two years ago was bring together a number of northern beaches mental health providers that focus on youth mental health, Lifeline, 180, Burdekin Association and a host of others to get together at Parliament to have a discussion with all the stakeholders together and the government to determine what we could do to fix it, short, medium and long term. That was my commitment to try and bring about a resolution to the issue. What came out of that was additional funding to repair and remedy the issue that you've raised. And we're committed to ensuring that the service young people on Northern Beaches get when it comes to mental health services is second to none and better than anywhere else that you can find in New South Wales. That is a personal commitment that I give to you and I'll keep working to try and deliver that day in and day out. Okay. Let's just hear from Jolene quickly. Is there more that you would like to see and what would that look like? 
I think there are two aspects to this question. And number one, it's ownership. When our local hospital is owned by an entity in the Cayman Islands who doesn't pay tax, then actually, who is responsible? Who is accountable for those health decisions? We need more transparency in the contracts so that we understand when things are not going well, who to hold accountable. The other aspect of this is, as Mr Gill says, delivery. We, the community was promised those four mental health beds and it has been more than six months and families out there are suffering and they are desperate because they've got nowhere to go. Those four mental health beds that were promised are yet another broken promise of this government. So until those beds are delivered, I say it's a lot of hot air and a lot of profit for private companies. And I think we should be putting patients and our community first. Thank you, Jolene. Um, I believe we have one question at the front. Yes, my name's Chris. I'm a 15-year-old school student who lives here on the Northern Beaches. And my question is for James Griffin. Um, I have been greatly affected by the climate crisis throughout my life. I have had to witness a man die in front of me in a cyclone in Western Australia. My grandparents' house in the Blue Mountains has come within 100 metres of the Black Summer bushfires and was very close to burning down. Yet your government continues to do absolutely nothing to help the climate crisis. This is my question to you today, and I would like a simple yes or no answer without any political jargon. Will you commit to acting in line with the advice of the IPCC and the UN by blocking all new and expanding fossil fuel projects and supporting the thousands of school students that are striking tomorrow to demand this? Or are you going to continue to burn my future and enable climate chaos for generations to come? James. Yep. Well Thank you, Chris, and thank you for your passion and also for the letter that you gave me earlier, which I'm sure uh, reiterates your question just then. As I said earlier, we were one of the first jurisdictions in the world to sign up to net zero. Yeah. So that should give you a good signal as to how committed we are to dealing with the climate crisis. So, sorry, with respect, James, the question was on essentially a moratorium on coal mines and gas mines, if that's correct, Chris. Yeah, so well, is, that, is that not something you support? We, we have set out a responsible transition plan as a part of our net zero strategy, which is the leading strategy in the country. If it was as easy as simply putting that moratorium in place, for example, you see the federal Labor government approving the Santos uh, project up in Queensland. There are significant challenges in how we transition to a renewable energy future. And we are working as rapidly and as sensibly as possible in achieving that outcome and that aim. Uh, I'd like to hear from Terry and Jolene as well. Thank you, Chris. And I can understand the extreme frustration that young people have when they see old buggers like myself who have been part of the generation that has caused the problem and for which I have to apologize. Um, and the, but I am and have been a member of the Greens and the Greens have, uh, will continue to take the forefront in trying to make sure that the future that you inherit and the future that my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren inherit is one that will be worth living in. Thank you. And Jolene, let's go to Chris's question. And Terry, I assume your position is to have a moratorium on f fossil fuel proposals. Jolene, is that yours as well? Um, Chris, thank you so much for that question. And I am absolutely answerable to you on this. Um, what I wanted to say is that I didn't get a clear air, uh, answer from our environment minister because I do believe that we do need to have a moratorium according to the IPCC report. 
That is the best available science. And while the Environment Minister and his government has a strategy to get to net zero, what they say about their strategy is not what they do when they are approving new coal and gas projects. Since they, since they agreed to reduce our global emissions to 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees in, in the Paris Agreement six years ago, they have continued to approve new coal and gas projects, 19 of them, that actually make a five-fold increase in our carbon emissions. So they may talk about a strategy, but what they are actually doing is increasing the emissions fivefold. They'll never get there. Uh, thank you, Jolene. Um, we have time for a few more questions. Um, lady at the front here with the mask on. Um, thank you. My question is to anybody, really. It's really in regards to um, economic management and to what the lady said. I was a nurse myself. The United Nations recommends that um, they actually say that not only should we do it, but it's a moral that we're not doing it, that we should put a super profits tax on oil and gas. We, however way you want to spin and gaslight the numbers, I've read it's approximately about $32 billion that we're losing in New South Wales. We have a notorious group of companies. There's about 12 of them that for 10 years, Chevron and, and Santos and probably, you know, there's a lot of them that are paying no tax. They have all these tax minimisation schemes. 85% is going offshore. They're a small employer, about one, one job of um, for, um, resources is roughly about 11 tourism. We see... $1.2 billion have gone into Brookfield, um, gone into the North Beaches Hospital to be gifted for $1 a year to Brookfield. Tax, once again, we've seen about half a billion dollars with Gladys and recently um, John um, Ballararo, pork barrel, 97% has gone just to Liberals on fires, which I find quite amoral. It really distresses me. It's, been more, it's more than politics. So why are we not using this $32 billion, which we should be getting from fossil fuels, and directing it to hospitals, women's shelters, and letting these, these companies basically steal our finite resources from these kids' futures. If we're going to, if we're, at least we're going to have for, um, fossil fuels, at least get some money from it. And this goes to my concern about, why, about independence, in that when we've got these vested interests, these lobbyists, these powerful donors, and we see them being treated in this preferential way, I want to know, if you're going to say that you're going to be a good economic manager, why aren't you doing it? Because we've got $11.4 billion worth of debt in New South Wales. Thank you. Okay. So, um, let me give that to James. The question essentially goes to... Should we collect more money from fossil fuel companies? If not, why not? So, and just the other point in your question, ultimately the ownership of the Northern Beaches Hospital reverts back to the people of New South Wales at the conclusion of that. 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm just... I'm, I'm, I'm just making the okay, point. Let's, let's let James Just wanted to clarify. Question, yeah. So, COVID's, COVID, flood, drought, pandemic, massive pressure on the New South Wales budget. Our... Um, state debt ratio at the moment is about 14%, compared to New S Victoria, which is at 26%. Today, S&P gave New South Wales another tick, AAA and two AA ratings, the only ones in the nation. That is despite all of the money that we've had to push out the door to support people through COVID, through JobKeeper, through funding to keep businesses' doors open, like here at Buckety's, through funding to support drought-impacted communities and billions of dollars to support flooded communities up there in Lismore and the Northern Rivers. So there has been so much pressure put on the state budget that, of course, there is some debt on the books. But we are looking towards a surplus in 23-24. The opportunity, if you look forward, is actually quite an exciting one for New South Wales in the export of hydrogen, green hydrogen, and also in the export of rare earths and minerals, which make a part of the modern economy. No, no, I, I'm, it's, it's not as simple. You, you need to, no, no, you need to have some context. 
the, the one lines and, and we, Sorry. You, you know, it, it, it requires context if we're to have a genuine discussion about it. Okay. There is equally a war in Ukraine which has put massive pressure on fuel and gas prices around the world. And so... Okay. Thank you. Let, thank you. Okay. So the question does go to royalties and... Okay. All right. James, you want to discuss? So we, Sorry. Can we please... So let as that is why we need to build up the green hydrogen and the rare earth strategy to offset these coal mines that everybody wants shut as quickly as possible. So we need to have something to replace it, and that's what we're working towards. Equally, we want to, yeah, and we will work to extract as much royalty out of uh, coal and, and out of coal and uh, other energy exports as okay. possible. All right, let's let's go to Jolene quickly um, on the issue of royalties and uh, James touched on green hydrogen, future technologies. How can we benefit from that? Thank you. Uh, Responsible economic management is very important to me. As a businesswoman, I can see that there is so much waste in this government. We are not getting a good price for our resources as the people of New South Wales. Queensland, in July last year, decided, because of the war in Ukraine, thank you, James, they decided because the coal price was going up that they were going to negotiate a good price for their resources, for the people of Queensland. Now, Queensland are now $5 billion in surplus. If New South Wales, who are lagging behind, had the political will to make the decision to implement that coal super profit royalty, we would have been earning $2 billion extra a month. We would have earned $23 billion so far, and we would be well in surplus. What lacked was political will and the removal of the conflict of interest of political donations from fossil fuel companies. That's it. All right. We do have time for one more question. I can see the gentleman there has the microphone. Go ahead. Right in on a bread and butter question. Families in Manly, what's the plan? Recession, rising food costs, mortgages busting. Uh, what's the plan for families? After all, families do vote and um, we're in a very stressful period for families. What would happen or what will happen if um, you're a member or anyone's a member? What's the plan? to make life easier for families. Thank you. Okay. So cost of living, can we get the microphone? Yeah, Terry, you can start. My response is very simple, Doug. Vote for the Liberals and you'll get, you get the same again. We've had nine consecutive interest rate rises. F food prices are up, transport prices are up, energy bills are up. What we're realising is that we've had 12 years of a Liberal government where they have not transitioned to a clean energy economy. Implementing a clean energy economy is actually good for the earth and good for our bank balance. We would be able to implement cost savings to your energy bills by having a rapid uptake of solar panels. We could have incentives this place, Nick wants to put solar panels on the roof of Bucketees, but his landlord says no. What we would do is make sure that there is an incentive for landlords, an incentive for tenants, and an incentive for the banks to retrofit all of the existing residential and commercial stock to drive down energy prices for tenants for landlords, for commercial businesses. When you drive down energy costs, it also impacts food bills because things are easier to, and cheaper to transport. And we would make sure that we are delivering those savings in a clean energy economy that not only is more profitable, but it also creates thousands more jobs. We heard from Perite and he said he was going to continue putting public money into fossil fuels. Why would we use public money inefficiently when we are in this economic crisis and people are hurting, when that's a dead industry? All right, and we can move to a clean energy economy and make it cheaper for you, for okay. your energy bills. We want to hear from everyone on this just as the last question. So, Bailey. 
Labor and Liberal, both of them, are putting millions and millions and millions of dollars into cruel industries for animals, for the environment. Why don't, instead of, say, giving millions of dollars to greyhound racing where dogs suffer and die, do we actually put it to the people and actually sort these issues out? That's what makes sense to me. All right. James, um, cost of living, there's interest rises, it seems, interest rate rises, it seems, you know, every week. Um, families are hurting. How, how would you like to help that? And, you know, people talked about the track record. Yep. How would you defend that? Yeah. Well, look, yeah, you have had 12 years of a, of a Liberal government in New South Wales. And we started that with a $30 billion infrastructure backlog left by 16 years of a rotten Labor government. What we've committed to today is no new taxes on families and small businesses. We've committed to free universal kindergarten preschool, making sure that every child around New South Wales gets the opportunity to be cared for. We've also committed to providing um, support for childcare for families that need it the most. And equally this week, when it comes to a place like Bucketys, I released the New South Wales Circular Economy Guidelines for Building Materials to incentivise and encourage organisations to retrofit and use materials to make sure that we do end up with a true green circular economy. <laughs> we will continue to make sure that we lower the cost of living and remove the pressures that parents, families and people in this community face, not only here in Manly but across the northern beaches, and we'll continue to do that because we've got a go good record of doing it. The back-to-school rebates, the, the support that's been provided to communities that need it the most, we'll continue to do that, and we've got a proud, strong track record of delivering. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will go to the last question from Isabel at the front. Make just very brief. I... Okay, questions of two questions. Well, I see there are only two young people in the room. I think it's... Im Excuse me. Okay. Le All right. Lady in the front. Hi. Um, I'd like to know how um, you're going to... I'd like to know if you are going to privatise more services that the New South Wales government of either persuasion is uh, responsible for? And if so, what? All right, let's get, let's get everyone's uh, answer briefly and then we'll finish up. Well, the value of New South Wales, the value that all of us as citizens have, has increased over the last 12 years because we have recycled assets. But the commitment from the Premier is no to no more privatisations. Yeah, Bailey? No, we don't want any more privatisations and corruption as well. I okay. we don't want to... Jolene? Sorry, was the question about will I privatise things? Uh, should, should there be further privatisation of government services? Well, I tried to catch a bus today and I was there for 45 minutes. And uh, so I would not recommend pri uh, privatising services that are essential because they're not working under this government. We need transparency in contracts. We need no more secret deals. We need to put the public first. So on the issue of privatisation, so no. Of, so no. Okay. Terry? No. Uh, the Greens have always been against the privatisation of public assets like power, and we will continue to oppose totally the privatisation. In fact, we would prefer to see uh, fu future renewable energy capacity and storage be in public hands, not in private hands. All right, thank you. And with... OK, last, last question. As a young person who hopes to own a house one day, hopefully on the northern beaches, because it's the most beautiful part of Sydney and Australia, I'm wondering what all of you will do to help me get into the housing market when I'm older. Thank you. All righty. Let's do the round again. Start with Terry, and we'll go left. My comment is simple, good luck, because, <laughs> because the, 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 the way that the, the governments of both persuasions are managing the economy and have done so for many years in which they have been very proud of the fact that 
there have been asset bubbles. And I, I can remember when John Howard said, when house prices were starting to get really hot, he said, you know, I've never had someone come and complain to me that, their, that the price of their house has increased. And that, that really set the tone. And it's one of the reasons why the younger generation are leaving the major parties in terms of voting, particularly with the Liberal Party, because it's the Liberal Party that led to this big increase in house prices. So how should we respond, just quickly? Don't vote Liberal. OK. Jolene? In terms of actual response from the government, how should it work? Housing affordability is a huge issue because my community is telling me people can't afford to live near where their families are. So I'm, I'm, my heart goes out to you for this experience. It's a huge uh, on-ramp to get to that first rung on the ladder. We need a mix of affordable housing, of social housing, and we need legislated targets to do that. And I tell you one thing, I will definitely make sure that you are part of the important housing mix that, would, that I would uh, fight for. And I will also make sure that you do not pay stamp duty for the rest of your life. Okay. No stamp duty and more integration in discussions on that. Uh, Bailey? Yeah, I, I, as a young person, that question is really something I relate to as well. Um, yeah, and I, the Animal Justice Party does support... Um, affordable housing, but it's definitely a tricky one as a young person. Even I'm, you know, that's something I'm struggling with as well, and I'd like um, the parties to all do something about it, because that's something I'm struggling with myself. All right. James? Yeah, well, thanks for the question. We've got a very clear policy, uh, and that is to provide you with the opportunity to ditch stamp duty up to a property price of $1.5 and in turn pay a small uh, annual property. That has also been expanded to make sure that uh, you can purchase further properties and not pay stamp duty on that. But it's worth pointing out that a Minns government, a Labor government, does not support that policy at all. So there is a clear choice when it comes to wanting to support first homeowners and their opportunity to get into the market. All right. Um, with that, I believe we have come to the end of the Q&A. Thank you very much for all your questions. Um, it's been... It's been a thriving conversation. Um, let's thank our candidates, James Griffin, Bailey Mason, Jolene Hackman, and Terry LaRue. All right. Now, I'd like to hand over to Nigel Howard, who's the uh, leader of the Northern Beaches Climate Action Network. Well, uh, actually, I'm, the, I'm the chief servant of the Northern Beaches Climate Action Network because uh, everyone tells me what to do and then I do all the work. That's how it works. So anyway, let me tell you what about Northern Beaches Climate Action Network. What we are not is an incorporated organisation. We have no board, we have no money, we have no members. We're just a network. We're a network of other organisations that do have the money, do have the network, the members, etc., etc. Um, and uh, everything we do is scratched together between the different groups. Now, how many groups are, do you think there are on the northern beaches that care about climate action? If you think it's more than 10, put your hands up. More than 20? More than 30? More than 40? More than 50? <laughs> It's actually 50, <laughs> as, as of yesterday, but it keeps changing. Anyway, so what do we do? We get together as a group, as a bunch of volunteers, and we, all our events are ad hoc. Um, now, most organisations describe themselves as non-partisan. We don't do that. We are partisan. But guess what? We are polypartisan. So we want every voice heard on climate, on all kinds of issues, we want every, verse, uh, every voice heard. Doesn't matter what your politics, doesn't matter uh, what your politics, your voice is welcome. And the only royalty that we have, the only VIPs that we have in Northern Peaches Climate Action Network are our youth. Yay! Because they can speak with a moral authority um, that we should listen to. Um, our events are ad hoc. And there's a huge tool, pool of talent 
uh, with an, a, a list of about 800 people who get involved in what we're doing. We organise events where an individual organisation doesn't have the resources or is conflicted in some way and uh, not able to organise. Our soapboxes are particularly appreciated because they, the way they work is that anyone who turns up can speak, but nobody can speak for more than three minutes. All our events are free, and the only funding we get is from a begging jar that we pass around. And so that's how, how, we, how we run. Uh, everything is organised through our Facebook page, and you just look up MB Can on Facebook, and then you can find us. And you can see what all the different groups are trying to do. But the main reason I'm up here is to thank everybody. So firstly, I want to thank Catherine, my co-organiser, because I can tell you for sure this would not have happened without her. I want to thank Nick McDonald. Where is he? There he is, by the bar. There's a surprise. He hasn't even noticed we're talking about him. We're talking about you, mate. So we just want to thank you, Nick, for being the real host of this event. And uh, he told me that the beers are all free for the rest of the evening. No, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. And very important people here to our candidates. Um, just, just how brave are they putting themselves forward for election and even braver for standing in front of the, the lion's den of us and addressing our questions. And that comes to the next people I want to thank. And that's all of you for engaging so well. Great questions. Nice little bit of tension going on there. I always love a little bit of that. And so thank you very much, all the audience. And thank you to everyone in an I Love Northern Beaches t-shirt. Um, these guys work very hard to bring this event to you. So if you see them standing by the bar, wistfully, buy them a drink. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Wayne over here from Humph Hall, who's organised all our video. And Andrew from Northern Beaches Radio. And he, I've got a message here from Andrew. It says, can you announce at the end, replay at 2 o'clock Saturday on Radio Northern Beaches, listen on 90.3 FM or streaming on rnb.org.au. Good. And lastly, for all the media covering our event, I think I've seen one person. <laughs> and very lastly, to the very special person here, Will Cassell. <laughs> this young man has come all the way back from Canberra where he's studying um, uh, law and, what else? Law and art, um, just for this event. So, Will is... A, Will is a young man that we are all going to see more of, I can guarantee it. And we have a little uh, gift, a little token. Well, we've got one, but I can't find it. I'll give it to you in a minute. <laughs> we'll just pretend it's this. <laughs> We have got a gift, I'll give it to him in a minute. So this is normal form for Northern Beaches Climate Action Network. Quite a few cock-ups, but we get there in the end and everyone's reasonably happy. So thank you all for coming. So one last thing, our candidates are sticking around. If you didn't get your question in, nobble them now, buy them a drink and they'll answer your questions. Thank you.